Good morning. Good morning. I titled uh, this presentation today, Be a Serial Entrepreneur. That's uh, cereal with a C, for like breakfast cereal. I'll explain that in about 15 minutes. What you should know though that be a serial entrepreneur is a core value at Airbnb. It means not only be an entrepreneur, but be creative and be scrappy. Do more with less. And it's a big part of our story. And this morning what I'm going to share is the Airbnb founding story. Um, there's three of us that started this company together. Myself, Nathan, Joe on the left, and Brian on the right. And we were all roommates at one time. Uh, we lived here in San Francisco, this apartment. And in October of 2007, the rent on this apartment was increased 25%. And I and another roommate decided we had had enough and I was moving out. So Brian, who was not yet living in the apartment, he was in Los Angeles, Joe called Brian and said, why don't you come to San Francisco to be an entrepreneur? So Brian quit his job in Los Angeles, drove to San Francisco, and upon arrival was told that the rent would be $1,150. But Brian only had $1,000 in his bank account and had just quit his job. So he had a math problem. Um, so the two of them are both designers, and it just so happened that there was a design conference that was coming to San Francisco the following weekend. And they got the idea to rent out one of the extra bedrooms as a bed and breakfast. Well, there was no bed in this bedroom, uh, but Joe had an air bed in the closet. So instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, they called it an air bed and breakfast. And they created a really simple web page using WordPress, just a blog, to put up an advertisement. They wrote to a number of local bloggers who uh, gave them links. And within a day, they had three people who wanted to stay with them. There was uh, a 35-year-old woman from Boston, a father of four from Utah, and a man from India. And that weekend, they made not only $1,000, um, but they showed their guests around the city and they all went to the conference together and made wonderful friendships. So much so that the man from India invited them to his wedding two years later. And so, fast forward a couple months, it's now January 2008, and I had just quit my job, and the three of us decided we wanted to start a company together. And uh, the guys told me the story that had happened in October. And we reflected on that and we said, there must be other people and other situations where this concept would be a good idea. And so we set out to build a website. And what we did was actually very simple. It's different than what you see today. But basically, it was a directory of events where locals could put up their spare bedroom just for the event, and those coming in from out of town could look it up and uh, basically give you a phone call. It was a directory. It was a glorified Craigslist, basically. Very simple site. It only took three weeks to build. And we decided to launch it for South by Southwest in 2008, March 2008. We thought this is where Twitter had launched a year before. This was where we were going to make our big launch. So we finished the site about a week and a half before the event. We got about a dozen properties on the website. And I think two or three people might have actually used it. One of the, which was Brian himself. So Brian flew down to Austin, Texas, and his host picked him up at the airport, brought him to his house, and uh, the guy's wife had made Brian dinner, really nice. Uh, the, uh, the air bed was set up with a chocolate on the, on the pillow. Wonderful hospitality. Well, at the end of the night, the host asked Brian, do you have the money? Because this was before we accepted payment through the website. And so Brian said, oh, I had forgotten to go to the ATM. Can I bring it to you tomorrow? And the guy said, hey, no problem. So the next night, before bed, the host asked Brian again, uh, were you able to get that money for me? And Brian had forgotten, again, to go to the ATM. Now at this point, the host started to get a little suspicious of Brian. He said, who is this guy that I don't really know that I met on the internet, who's sleeping on my bed? <laughs> 
And uh, the hospitality began to wore off. And um, we thought to ourselves afterwards, how nice would it be if you could just take care of the money up front? So when you arrive, you can really focus on the hospitality. There was another thing we learned from this event, which was that afterwards, uh, people would ask us, I'm, I'm going to London, but not for an event. Can I use your service? We said, of course not. You can only use it for events because that's how you build trust. If they don't know why you're coming to town, who will let you into their house? But then we really got to thinking, and we came up with a new vision for air, bed, and breakfast, and that was, why don't we just try to make it just as easy to book someone's home as it is a hotel? We had this motto, three clicks to book it. Basically, you would go to our homepage, type in a destination, see some search results, and hopefully find something you like. And if you liked it, you could click book it. Three clicks to book it. And these are all screenshots from the early days. And so this is what we set out to build later in the summer of 2008. And we had to figure out how are we going to launch this new concept, this new website. And we decided, why don't we use an event once again? Um, and that summer, everybody was talking about the Democratic National Convention, uh, which is going to be held in August 2008 in Denver. It's where Barack Obama was going to receive the Democratic um, Party's nomination for presidency. And um, big historic event. They had upgraded the venue to the stadium that holds 80,000 people. And while we looked up in Denver, there's only 17,000 hotel rooms. So we knew right away there was going to be a problem, that there's going to be a need for alternatives. And so we rushed to build this website in three months. And again, we launched it two weeks before the event. And we were lucky. There were a lot of locals who were looking to get out of town and make some money. And so within the first week, we got 800 people to put up their properties on our website uh, because people wanted to be sure that they found a booking. And um, meanwhile, the news was doing stories about how so many people want to come to this historic event and participate, um, but that there aren't any places to stay. And so we said, we wrote to the local newspaper and we said, actually, uh, we have 800 places that are confirmed available right now on our website. And they said, that's interesting. Let's do a story about that. And so we very quickly got in the newspaper. And by the end of the week, it had gotten picked up by CNN International, and we were doing a video interview. And suddenly, everyone across the nation, maybe even further, uh, was hearing about this new concept, uh, air bed and breakfast. And for this event, we probably had 100 people stay on our service. It felt great. Everything that you would want when launching your company. Unfortunately, it's just the beginning. And this is the typical life cycle, emotionally, of a startup. It starts with a lot of excitement, climaxing when you launch your company. And hopefully, you get some, some press coverage, and you just feel on top of the world. But that quickly wears off. And for us, one week later, the crickets were chirping. Nobody cared about us. We weren't relevant anymore. Um, and that began a very long period known as the trough of sorrows, where no matter what you do, it doesn't get any better. And it only actually gets worse. And eventually, if you're lucky, things do get better. Um, but during this period, we had to find some solutions to finance the company and generate press. So after the convention, we had uh, the contact information for many reporters who we had gotten in contact with and been featured with uh, for the DNC. And we were thinking, how can we leverage those political reporters' contact details to get more press? And so the election was coming up very shortly in November, two months away. And we thought to ourselves, our name at the time was Airbed and Breakfast. We've done a lot with the airbeds. Maybe we should do more with the breakfast. And we came up with the idea to create a presidentially themed cereal, Obama O's and Captain McCain's. And so the idea was we created this concept, all original artwork designed. We got boxes printed. We even went to the supermarket and bought cereal and restuffed that cereal into our boxes. And we mailed 100 of each box to uh, the reporters. And we thought, 
If we email them, they'll just delete the email. But if we send them a box like this, they're going to have to ask us questions. They're going to want to know where did this come from. They're going to want to hear our story. And sure enough, it worked. Within a week of having done that, we were on CNN again, talking about the breakfast cereal. And actually, this became the number one political video of the day and was featured on the homepage. And uh, well, we had actually created 400 additional boxes of each. And we had made on our website a place where we were selling these boxes for $40 each. And that day when we were featured on the homepage, we sold a $40 box of cereal every three minutes. Within a week, we had sold $30,000 worth of cereal. And that's how we financed the company in the early days. Not ideal, and this is where the term be a serial entrepreneur comes from, this story right here. To be scrappy, to think creatively, and be entrepreneurial. Of course, we had tried to raise money the traditional way as well. So over this summer, we had been reaching out to different angel investors, different venture capitalists, and uh, not with much luck. Investors ran from us like we were the plague. And one particularly memorable story, we met with an angel investor at a well-known cafe in Palo Alto, and uh, we were pitching him. And halfway through the pitch, he just got up and walked out. And he left his drink half, half drunk, this smoothie. And we had thought he got out, uh, had gotten up to maybe just put some money in the parking meter and he was going to come back. But we waited and waited, and he never came back. And this was a picture I've taken of Brian looking perplexed. <laughs> On another occasion, we were going down to Sand Hill Road to pitch a venture capitalist, and we were looking at the slide deck the night before. And this was one of the slides in the deck. And it basically says that, we were going to make $200 million in revenue within our first three years. And I'm a very analytical person. My two partners are designers. And I was trying to explain to them, that doesn't really make sense. There's no way we we'll, can ever make $200 million in three years if you do the math. And so we agreed that night that we would change it to $20 million, that that was going to be more realistic. And so the next day, we're in the meeting. And they come to the slide, and they had changed it. They had changed it to $2 billion. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? And of course, the, uh, the, the guy that we were pitching wasn't buying any of it. But I asked him later, why did you do that? And Brian said one of our trusted advisors had told him that investors don't want M's, they want B's, baby. <laughs> I mean, he is right, but we didn't have this story to go along with it. So times were just about to get worse, actually. So this was just the beginning of the recession, fall of 2009. We had been at this for nine or 10 months without jobs, without having been able to raise any money except for $30,000 from cereal, which really was actually the cost of all the cereal to begin with. Um, and Sequoia Capital published this, uh, this presentation basically saying that the good times were over and that everyone was going to need to save up capital because you might not be able to fundraise again. So if, as if things weren't hard enough, things got more bleak. And we were basically at the point of asking ourselves, when should we give up? When should we quit? It's almost been a year now. Uh, and despite whatever we do, we're only making $200 a week. We can't seem to increase that. And one of our advisors said, you should apply to Y Combinator. Y Combinator Combinator is an accelerator program, very well known, run by Paul Graham. And our advisor had gone through this program him himself. And he said, this would be really good for you. It'll really pull you together, get you focused. And we realized that up until now, although we had worked very hard, we still hadn't given it 100%. Um, meaning that I was moonlighting a little bit on the side. The other guys had some other commitments. I was in Boston, they were in San Francisco. We weren't 100% focused yet. And we realized that before we could quit, we had to say we gave it our best shot. So we agreed to, uh, to try out for Y Combinator. You have to apply, and you, we were lucky enough to get an interview. And when you interview, it's a five minute interview. It goes really quick. And within two minutes into the interview, basically Paul Graham, the guy who runs this program, was trying to convince us to do something else. So our interview wasn't going very well. And then it was over five minutes later. 
And as we were walking out, Joe took out of his bag a box of the Obamos and gave it to PG. And he said, uh, what's this? Did you buy this for me? And we said, no, we made this. And he says, I don't understand. So we told him the story of the cereal. And he loved that story so much because it proved to him that we were scrappy and resourceful. And he has this, this, uh, this very well-known quote um, about the importance of uh, being like a cockroach, basically being unkillable and very scrappy. And so because of that story, he led us into the program. And that's when things began to change. We got super focused and very disciplined. I moved to San Francisco again, and we all lived together in that same apartment I showed you before, and we got hyper-focused. We woke up at the same time at 8 a.m. I was sleeping on an air bed in Joe's bedroom. We would work all day, only taking breaks to go to the gym, take a shower, and maybe go grocery shopping, make breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner. Uh, but otherwise, we were working six days a week, really focused. And because it was the recession, PG told everybody, he says, revenue is going to be super important. It's really important that by demo day, which is um, the kind of the culmination of Y Combinator, after 13 weeks you go to demo day where you pitch investors, he said it's really important that on demo day you can show that you are profitable. And uh, we came up with this concept of uh, ramen profitability, ramen like the, uh, the soup noodles. And basically ramen profitability uh, was for us was $1,000 a week. It meant enough money to buy ramen and pay the rent. $1,000 a week. And so we created this graph of our revenue. And the red line was our goal. And we would update it every week. And we posted it all over the apartment. It was over the fireplace, and it was right in the middle of the mirror in the bathroom. So you couldn't get away from this thing. It kept us hyper-focused on what we were trying to do. It was during Y Combinator that we got some really valuable advice. Um, this is from the, uh, the creator of Gmail, actually. And he told us that it's better to have 100 users that love you than 1,000 users that like you. And so we, we thought about that. And Paul Graham told us something else. He said it's OK to do things that don't scale. It's counterintuitive a little bit. You're making an internet company. The whole idea is that it's self-serve and it can scale to millions. But he said when you're trying to find that product market fit, it's OK to do things that don't scale. And he asked us, where are your users? And we said, well, our users are everywhere. He said, well, no, where do you have the most users? We said, New York. He said, go to New York and meet all your users. Which, again, was counterintuitive because we had no money. How are we going to buy plane tickets and do all this? He said, figure it out. So over the course of four different weekends, we went to New York and we met all of our users. At the time, we only had 20 or 30 hosts in New York. So it wasn't that hard, actually. And we noticed something about our hosts. We noticed that they had really bad photos of their properties. Uh, this was, again, in 2008, 2009, and uh, camera phones weren't as, uh, as good as they are today. So a lot of the photos were low resolution, really dark. And so we would call the hosts up and we'd say, uh, would you like a professional photographer to come to your home and photograph your apartment for free? And people were a little confused, but they said, sure, why not? It's free. And so they got the knock on the door. And who was it? But Joe and Brian, right? The co-founders of the company. So they were a little surprised by that. Uh, but they took the pictures uh, with a camera that they had rented. And uh, while they are there, they opened up the website and showed them how to use the website and got product feedback. And then also invited uh, the hosts out to beer later on that, that night. And so we'd get together, say, 10 or so people at a time for beer. And we'd, we'd build a relationship, build a rapport, tell them our story, try to make them into our evangelists. Uh, and so much so that once we went back to San Francisco, we were able to give them a call and ask them things like, hey, your, uh, your profile description, it's only a paragraph, and you have a really nice apartment. Do you mind if we write two more paragraphs for you? Um, or you're trying to charge $400 a night. That seems a bit unrealistic to start with. Maybe we could start with $50 a night, and if you get too many inquiries, you can always increase it. 
So had we not met these people and built a relationship, we would have never been able to ask them that. But because they were, they had heard our story and they wanted us to be successful, they were cooperative. And as a result of taking high quality photos, lowering the prices, improving the profile descriptions, and just generally getting the host to cooperate with us and wanting us to succeed, suddenly we had a really nice product. And it was at this point that guests from around the world started booking these properties in New York. And so the host started making money. They would tell their friends. Their friends would come to the site, see the really high bar that was established, and they would emulate that. They would put up their own property um, and, and take the good photos, et cetera. And um, meanwhile, people were coming from New York, from around the world, and then they would go home. And oftentimes, the guests would become hosts themselves. And so very quickly, this idea began to cross-pollinate. And so properties were popping up in Berlin, Barcelona, Hong Kong, all over the world, and suddenly you had a lot more places you could go to. And today it's exploded. There's 600,000 properties in 192 countries, 40,000 different cities, literally everywhere. And those properties are being booked. So it took us four years to get our first four million guests. But in 2013 alone, we serviced seven million additional guests for 11 million today. So classic hockey stick growth. And on any given night, there's about 150,000 people staying in other people's homes. And so what we have realized, though, is it goes way beyond just hospitality. We've actually created a new generation of serial entrepreneurs. We did a study uh, in Spain specifically surveying our hosts. And what we found is that 28% of our hosts in Spain are entrepreneurs. And that those entrepreneurs have been responsible for about 40,000 jobs here. And these are new companies. So half of them are younger than five years. 25% are within the last year. And a third of them are located here in Barcelona. But it's not just about the money that is helping these entrepreneurs to succeed. They're actually using the service to meet other people. 55% use it to meet other people. 36% use it to meet clients. And 25% use it to get opinions on their work. And so with that in mind, we partnered with the event here today, four years from now. And we thought, how cool would it be if we could connect the entrepreneurs in our host community with entrepreneurs who are visiting from far and wide? So I'm not sure how many of you were able to take advantage of this, but we had many entrepreneurs staying with other entrepreneurs, hopefully making connections, hopefully propelling their uh, businesses forward. I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you found it inspiring. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of the week here. Thank you for having me.